there's a couple of interim questions, a general question that's come in from a few people. Should we back efforts to encourage the nuclear armed states to adopt um, no first use as part of a process to them signing TPNW, hopefully? Yeah, <clears throat> that that is a, a, a that's a that's that's a question about which there are a number of, of, of different points of view, I think. Um, because the treaty itself, of course, uh, prohibits the use and the threat of use. But as your previous question also raised, the, the nuclear nine haven't joined it. Now, I had, had got to a certain point. I used to absolutely advocate for no first use agreements among the five, among the nine. We should also recognize the, the five are so obsessed by their status in, with nuclear weapons. Let's never forget status is a massive kind of facilitator of nuclear proliferation. It isn't really about security. And, I, and if you read my report, you'll see that Blair is pretty explicit that, that you know, when it came down to it, he and Gordon Brown decided that they were going to, that they, they weren't going to be the people that went to Parliament and said, you know what, we're not going to have nuclear weapons. You know? <laughs> and status was the thing there. And um, for the five, it's wrapped up somewhat with them having the status of, of permanent seats on the on the Security Council. I personally definitely, you know, support reform of the Security Council. But the truth of the matter is, those permanent seats were delivered to those five when only one of them at the time was a nuclear armed state, and that was the US. The others did not have nuclear weapons. They were the, the, the ones that sort of came out, um, out of the Second World War as the ones that hadn't been utterly defeated. And, uh, you know, and, 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 and actually the, what we think of as China, the People's Republic of China, didn't take that Chinese seat until, I can't remember exactly when, but it was a good 15 uh, years after China was nevertheless named as one of the permanent members of the Security Council. So we have to delink those things. Uh, that's a, an important point. On no first use, I think that now that we have a treaty that unequivocally prohibits use and threat of, of, of use of nuclear weapons, we can encourage unilateral and possibly bilateral US, Soviet or India, Pakistan kinds of agreements on no first use. We should encourage no first use to become part of their policies. And we can do that without that in any way conferring a legal right for second strike. That's the big danger in my mind. And that's why I absolutely oppose any attempt to have a treaty or a negotiation on a no first use agreement among the five or among anyone else because that would undermine, absolutely undermine um, uh, the you know, core prohibition that is in the NP, uh, the core prohibition that is in the TPNW. Um, it can only be done unilaterally or as a bilat bilateral agreement, but it would be a confidence builder. Now, do I think it's gonna happen? Well, you know, I, again, I spent many years you know, hoping that it would, supporting it in conjunction with de-alerting, with taking nuclear weapons off alert. The thing about nuclear, uh, no first uses, it's what's known as, as declaratory policy. It's, you know, China had, has still has a no first use, but China's current arsenal is actually being built up now to be able to do a first strike. And so every, all the, a lot of the analysts in what I refer to as the military, industrial, bureaucratic, academic kind of establishment that, uh, you know, surround all of the militaries in the nuclear armed states and quite a lot of the militaries within NATO and, and Australia and Japan as well. They are all saying now that whatever China's declaratory policy of no first use is on the ground, they're completely equipped, able, capable of a first use. 
And that's a big problem about declaratory no first use statements. Then we had the UK saying back in what was the year 2000, I think it was, saying that they'd reduced uh, notice to fire to days uh, rather than, than, than minutes and that they detargeted. But did that mean they couldn't retarget and fire? Would that, you know, it's, it was declaratory policy. And in fact, they can retarget and fire Trident on the instruction of the, the Prime Minister and the, the, the Chief of, of Defence Staff um, within around 15 minutes. The, it's operationally possible to fire first from, you know, the submarines, regardless of what the doctrine is back home on paper. And that's a real problem. And so one of the things that we're looking at, and I think the John Ainsley again did really interesting work on, was what would you, what would you do on a submarine physically, you know, operationally, to make it impossible for the, you know, for a submarine, either inadvertently, or if, you know, a group of, uh, if the captain or a group of the submariners, you know, went do lally which is obviously always a possibility, um, to stop nuclear weapons being fired. Now, if you combine no first use with practical operational physical steps that interfered with between the guidance system and the warhead, in effect, or disabled the missile, and, and the missile had to take two or three days to be re-enabled re or something like that, then actually you might have a combination that would raise confidence. Otherwise, frankly, no first use to a very large extent, it's, it's purely words, it's declaratory. I know some of our colleagues in the US are really pushing for it. The problem with those things is that if they get it, that's probably all they're gonna get out of the Biden administration. And that's not enough.